Hello, I'm not supposed to be in this video this week, but I just got a new suit, so I thought I might show it off. Well, may as well make myself useful while I'm here. Imagine a musical bloodbath on the streets of Chicago 70 years ago, as two bands fought out the greatest turf war in the history of music. This is the Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf. The history of music is studded with epic rivalries and beefs between talents competing for ego, glory or market share. From the friendly rivalries of Duke Ellington and Count Basie to the not so friendly rivalries of Fred Van Epps and Vess Osman to the press inventions like Prince Buster and Derek Morgan who are actually very good friends. They played their beef up in the press until it started to provoke pitch battles between their fans in the streets of Kingston, so they cooled it off. To the murderous, the East Coast West Coast Farrago amongst rappers in the mid 90s, the hilarious only write songs about dead blondes versus arthritic monkey feud between Keith Richards and Elton John. More respectful rivalries, Duke Reed and Coxone Dodds, jealousies between Salieri and Mozart, Brahms and Franz Liszt and Tchaikovsky and Brahms, Van Morrison's well-spoken contempt for Bruce Springsteen, unlikable as Springsteen is, I, I, I fail to see Van's point on this. Modern handbag fights such as Blur Oasis or Morrissey Billy Bragg, The Beatles and Brian Wilson and Taylor Swift versus, well who've you got? But the one rivalry that more than anything drove the classic canon forward and helped make the music we know today the music we know today was the friendly, not so friendly rivalry between the two titans of the Chicago Blues, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf. These two cast such a long shadow over electric blues that they, along with B.B. King, still probably constitute the working template for the music 70 years since they laid it down. Mud and Wolf, largely in partnership with Willie Dixon, wrote the songs that constitute the bulk of the book for the busy blues-busting bar band. But as in all things, the rivalry and the heights to which it drove the music was the product of remote circumstances and fortunate consequences that are never likely to be repeated. Both native Mississippians, Wolf was three years older than Muddy, arriving to the world as Chester Burnett at White Station in 1910, and Muddy as McKinley Morganfield at Rolling Fork in 1913. Both were successful local entertainers, Wolf learning the rudiments of his showmanship and first songs from no lesser luminary than Charlie Patton, and Mud being a juke joint owner who was recorded by the Library of Congress in 1941 and 1943. It was in 1941 that Wolf joined up for a hitch in the US Army, where he stayed until 1943, joining his family in West Memphis. In 1943, Muddy lit out north, not in search of work in the factories, but to fulfill his conviction that he could be a professional musician. Muddy scuffled and shuffled driving trucks and working in a paper mill and just about made a living as a musician in Chicago, but that all changed in 1946 when his uncle made him a gift of his first electric guitar. By 1948 his big break had arrived when Leonard Chess, later with his brother Phil, a Polish immigrant who was ploughing a similar furrow to the Erdogan brothers in New York with Atlantic, signed him to the Aristocrat record label and gave him the freedom to do in the studio what he was doing in the clubs. One unusual thing about the Chess brothers is that Leonard was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but Phil, who stood side by side with him through the glory years of Chess, wasn't. His first single, the propulsive Delta throwback, I Can't Be Satisfied, is like a half-straddled Rubicon, one foot in the Delta past and one in the electric future, but Muddy was soon wholeheartedly across that puny stream, and his aristocrat years produced intense blues such as Muddy Jumps One, Train Fair Home, and Mean Red Spider. 1948 saw Wolf form his first regular band, including longtime cohorts Jimmy Johnson and Matt Guitar I Was in the Blues Brothers Murphy and junior Mystery Train Parker. 
He was soon hosting live broadcasts out of West Memphis, Arkansas, as well as sitting in with the original Sonny Boy Williamson in a show beamed out of Helena, which was also in Arkansas. 1950-51 saw Muddy establish himself as top dog on the Chicago scene, assembling his crack band of Otis Spann on piano, Jimmy Rogers on guitar, Elgin Evans on drums and Little Walter on harmonica. His early chess sides included classics such as Rolling Stone, Rollin' and Tumblin' and That's the Stuff You Gotta Watch. 1951 was a pivotal year for Wolf as well. Ike Turner, who was working as a freelance talent scout, recommended him to Sam Phillips, who ran the equally freelance Memphis Recording Service. Phillips, who eked a living recording local talent and leasing master tapes to larger labels, recalled Wolf as being the most talented artist he ever worked with. By the autumn of 1951, Leonard Chess had heard the recordings and did a deal with Phillips. Wolf's first single, Moaning at Midnight, backed with How Many More Years, was recorded in Memphis in July 1951, which saw him billed as The Howlin' Wolf, with songwriting credits for both sides credited to the mysterious Carl Germany. The release was a big hit, both sides making the national R&B Top 10. Muddy had had five R&B Top 10s by this time. Wolf was to stay based in Memphis until 1952, but his Memphis recordings were still being issued by Chess until 1954. In 1952, Wolf released two more rip-roaring classics, The Deep Blues of The Wolf Is At Your Door and For Mr. Highwayman and Muddy Hit Big With The Raw Power Of She Moves Me. The biggest hit Muddy played on that year, however, was Little Walter's Seismic Duke, perhaps the greatest example of blues harmonica playing, certainly one of the very best known. It was a key element in Little Walter being the only man inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame purely as a harmonica player. Down in Memphis, the scene was becoming a force fit to rival Chicago. Wolf, B.B. King, Ike Turner, Willie Nix, Bobby Bland, Johnny Ace, they were all ramping up and a greasy young kid in the Lauderdale court named Elvis Presley was soaking it all up. Leonard Chess, who knew money when he saw it, offered Wolf a lucrative contract, which meant he earned more than money, to record exclusively for Chess. Eventually, Wolf took him up on it and became, in his own words, the onlyest N-word to drive himself up to Chicago in his own car. And suddenly, there was another personality as large as Muddy Waters on the scene in Chicago. Muddy, at first, was welcoming to Wolf, even going so far as to have him stay in his home while he got himself settled. But the rivalry between the domineering Muddy and the hyper-competitive Wolf soon rose, especially when Muddy had one of his greatest years in 1954 with songs such as I'm your hoochie coochie man, I'm a natural born lover and I just want to make love to you, any one of which would have made a lesser man's reputation. Wolf also released one of his defining records, Evil. Evil also marked the debut of Hubert Sumlin, one of the greatest guitarists ever and Wolf's chief collaborator and factotum for the remainder of his life. A cause of rising tension between the two men was Mudd's three great hits that that year were all written by Willie Dixon, and Wolf didn't feel he was getting the same access to Dixon's quality songs that Mudd did. Dixon always denied this, claiming every time he offered Wolf a song, Wolf would say he didn't like it. Eventually, Dixon twigged to this and started to use reverse psychology, telling Wolf that this was a song that Muddy had turned down. The ever cocky Wolf would naturally take the song to show Muddy what he'd missed out on. It may have helped Dixon that uh, while Wolf was a giant, Dixon was even bigger, standing six foot six in bare feet. Although Dixon was well known as a gentle giant and a man of extraordinary principle. By 1955, the rivalry turned bitter between Muddy, the imperious ruler of the stage, versus Wolf, the supreme showman. Muddy cut one of his high watermark songs, the rambunctious and uber macho I'm Ready, whereas Wolf only visited the studio once in 1955 to cut four sides, including the romping, stomping Who Will Be Next. But it also saw Wolf bring a suit against Muddy for allegedly using his influence with local promoters to cut Wolf out of gigs. While 1956 saw the two titans toe-to-toe -to -toe again, Muddy with I Want to Be Loved and the iconic Manish Boy, Wolf with the mean-sounding smokestack light and the equal classic I Asked for Water, She Bought Me Gasoline, Muddy came out swinging and hired Hubert Sumlin away from Wolf's band on the promise of doubling the money that Sumlin made with Wolf. While Muddy kept his promise, he gave Sumlin hardly any meaningful parts to play and genuinely treated him like an underling. 
Sunderland soon tired of life with Muddy and broached Wolf about taking him back, which Wolf did, and as a token of the esteem in which he held Sunderland, maintained him on the wage that Muddy paid him. Sunderland repaid Wolf in 1969 when Wolf had his first heart attack. After Wolf slumped forward in the passenger seat of the car Sunderland was driving to a gig, Sunderland rescued a 2x4 from the rear of the car and gave Wolf a hefty whack across the back, which jolted Wolf's heart back into rhythm. It's not recorded whether Wolf made the gig that evening, but he probably did. Wolf, along with his girlfriend and later wife Lily, was famous for his financial acumen and discipline and had a policy that his musicians were always paid in full, on time, and he even had social security and health insurance plans for them. This came at a price. Wolf always expected his musicians to be on time, well dressed and not to drink before or during gigs and most importantly, not to use vulgar language in Lily's presence. Muddy's bands on the other hand were more garrulous and street gangish who referred to themselves as Muddy Waters Drunk Ass Band. Muddy fired the next shot across Wolf's bow in 1958 when he undertook a triumphal tour of the United Kingdom. Although there had been an electric blues band in London since 1957, which had been recorded and released, albeit on a tiny indie label, this was provincial England's first exposure to the blues. Touring support was from Otis Spann, with Chris Barber's Dixieland band augmenting the sound. Despite the clash of styles and despite the lack of any rehearsals, Barber and his musicians proved quick and sympathetic learners. The focus, however, was on the volume with which Span and Mud played, which was unheard of at the time and caused outrage both in the conservative music press and amongst the more purest acoustic blues fans. But it made Muddy Water and the Blues loud, earthy and hypersexual, a buzzword amongst post-war British youth and the seeds of the great British blues boom were sown, as well as the first steps for some of the greatest guitarists ever. Commercially, to this point, Muddy had been much more successful, with 14 R&B top 10s to Wall's 5. But just as he was becoming something of a course celebre in the UK, at home, Chess was starting to focus on selling more to white kids through their rock and roll acts like Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley. And they couldn't sell Mud's music to kids who were buying Berry's super hopped up aspirational fantasies. However, by 1960, Wolf was starting a hot streak, propelled by Willie Dixon songs like Spoonful and Wang Dang Doodle, and if anything, he for the first time eclipsed Muddy on the Chicago scene. Muddy, after a highly successful performance at Newport Folk Festival, saw the writing on the wall and started to move his style back somewhat towards his earlier Delta-influenced records. As the hits became thin on the ground, Muddy was at first reduced to overdubbing his voice on rejected Earl Hooker tracks such as You Shook Me and You Need Love, which were both later appropriated by Led Zeppelin, and later to even further depredations. When in Chicago in 1965, the Rolling Stones visited the Chess Studios at 2120 South Michigan Avenue to seek out their hero, Muddy Waters, the man whose song they named their band after. They found him not in the studio crafting hits, but atop a ladder, painting the studio walls. On May 20th, 1965, the band sat at Howling Wolf's feet as he appeared at their insistence on the nationwide pop music program Shindig. Into the mid-60s, while Muddy struggled, Wolf hit with I Ain't Superstitious, Tail Dragger, 300 Pounds of Joy and the mighty, mighty Killing Floor, the song that effectively passed the torch from the foundation electric bluesman to the new breed when Jimi Hendrix opened with it at Monterey in 1967. Eventually, Wolf's star dimmed as well as his health started to fail and Chess began to struggle financially and could no longer support legacy artists. Muddy stayed with Chess until 1975, Wolf until 1973, but both Muddy and Wolf's last singles were released in 1970. Both were subject to completely inappropriate retoolings of their style. Wolf with the notorious New Howling Wolf album, which he described in the press as being dog shit, and Muddy with the psychedelic styled electric mud. Perhaps some humility did them good, as Muddy in particular was said to have mellowed a good deal during that time of his life. Perhaps it was simply that the two old rivals realised there was nothing left worth fighting over, and after sharing a bill at a blues festival in Ann Arbor in 1969 and socialising afterwards, relations thawed considerably. Wolf issued his last album in 1973, Defiant to the End, 
and passed away after complications from kidney surgery in 1976, leaving behind his beloved Lily. But it was far from over for Muddy Waters, who sued Chess in 1975 for unpaid royalties and left at the behest of Johnny Winters to CBS, where he cut three excellent albums, Hard Again, I'm Ready and King B, the first two won Grammy Awards, and hit the road as blues royalty, frequently appearing with Eric Clapton, who was best man at his third wedding, the Rolling Stones, as well as appearing in the band's last waltz movie with a thumping mannish boy. He stayed out on the road until his health began to decline and his last gig was a show with Eric Clapton in late 1982. Muddy Waters, giant of the blues, passed away in his sleep in his home outside Chicago in 1983. Muddy and the Wolf. They were rivals, sometimes competitive ones, sometimes bitter ones, but it was always a rivalry that spurred them to try and outdo each other by making greater and greater records. But most importantly, it was the Chicago blues scene that Muddy and Wolf helped to promulgate and lead that was adopted by the young and up and coming generation of white musicians who merged the rock and roll sounds they'd grown up with, with the heavier, more forceful sounds of the blues and created what we know as rock music, which was of course then the dominant form of music for the next 10 years. And they did make very, very great records. Muddy Waters and Howling Wolf, the joint kings of the Chicago Blues.